Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Imuna Yisra El Solonamics 101 Live Project. You know, we've had a lot on the boat for quite some time. <laughs> so much came up. The Nat Turner um, conversation, Birth of a Nation. So many things came up, but we haven't forgot the Live Project. We got two more months to go. Um, Actually, it's almost a month and a half now. So we're going to finish out strong. We're going to finish out strong. Although we're still waiting for volunteers. I said, let me come on here and see if I can get some in. As you can hear, the last time I was on, my voice is getting a little bit hoarse. But we're going to push through anyhow, right? So at this point, we are on portion number seven of chapter, if I'm not mistaken, four. It says here, when he had refitted our ship and all things were in readiness for attacking the place, the troops were in readiness for attacking the place. The troops on the board, the transport were ordered to disembark. And my master as a ju junior captain had a share in the command of landing. This was on the 12th of April. The French were drawn up on the shore and had made every disposition to oppose the landing of our men. Only a small part of them this day being able to effect it. Most of them after fighting with great bravery were cut off and General Crawford with a number of others take prisoners. In this day's engagement, we had also our Lieutenant killed. Welcome those who have just joined us. This is the morning, yes, Fael. I'm continuing the reading of the Left Project. I know it's been some while, we're still on a lot of Equiano. He's on a boat, it's not a usual slave narrative, so you know, we got to make our way through this kind of like man bravado talk, you know, for sometimes for women, it's not that like, you know, interesting. He's just giving the nuts and bolts, but nonetheless, we started it. So we're going to continue to make our way through it again. If you would like to read and you do hear my voice sound a little bit, you know, feel free to let me know, as I've been saying for the last, I don't know how many months, 11, I suppose. Um, your voice, your voice is needed. Your voice is definitely needed. Hold on for me one second. All right, sorry for that. I just wanted to make sure I can see any comments or questions, and I want, I didn't want the YouTube automatic video to start. But definitely, your voice is needed. Lift your voice. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And, you know, depending on where we put our attention, uh, that's where we will get understanding on. And a lot of us, we have the opportunity, but I don't know how much we're taking part in understanding before we can address an issue. We have to kind of get an understanding or a handle on what it is that we're trying to address. So for, if for nothing else, the Left Project has enlightened me. So I want to give thanks and praise to the most high, um, just for the will to, to embark on such a, a journey as this. I'm going to continue. It says, on the 21st of April, we renewed our efforts to land the men, all the men of war being stationed along the shore to cover it and fight at the French batteries and breastworks from early in the morning till about four o'clock in the evening when our soldiers effected a safe landing. They immediately attacked the French and after a sharp encounter forced them from the batteries. I'm sorry, I didn't catch you guys up. Again, he was captured from the continent. He came to the Caribbean Barbados, if I'm not mistaken. He ended up in America, but not for long. He was uh, employed or bought by a English seaman and he is in England um, fighting for the English on their ships uh, and so this is why he's talking about the French and all this stuff like this. His his life as a slave was not the same as many others. So I'll continue. And again, the link is in the box if you would like to follow along. Before the enemy retreated, they blew up several of them, lest they should fall into our hands. Our men then proceeded to besiege the citadel, and my master was ordered on shore to the superintendent, the landing of all materials necessary for carrying on the siege. In this service, I mostly attended him. While I was there, I visited different parts of the island. And one day, particularly my curiosity almost cost me my life. He says, I wanted very much to see the mode of char charging the mortars and letting off the shells. And for that purpose, I went to the English battery, but very few yards from the walls of the citadel. 
There indeed I had an opportunity of completely gratifying myself and seeing the whole operation, but not without running a great risk, both from the English shells that burst while I was there and likewise from those of the French. One of the largest of their shells burst within nine to 10 yards of me. There was a single rock close by about the size of a butt and I got instant shelter under it in time to avoid the fury of the shell. Where it burst, the earth was torn in such a manner that two or three butts might easily have gone into the hole it made. And it threw great quantities of stones and dirt in a considerable distance. Three shots were also fired at me. Another boy who was along with me, one of them in particular seemed, winged with red lightning and impetuous rage. For with a most dreadful sound, it hissed close by me and struck a rock at a little distance, which it shattered into pieces. When I saw in what per perilous circumstance I was, I attempted to return the nearest way I could find and thereby I got between the English and the French sent sentinels. An English sergeant or sergeant who commanded the outpost seeing me and surprised how I came there, which was by stealth along the seashore, reprimanded me severely for it and instantly took the sentinel off his post into custody for his negligence in suffering me to pass the lines. While I was in this situation, I observed at a little distance a French horse belonging to some islanders, and I determined to mount him for the greater expedition in getting off. Accordingly, I took some cord which I had about me and making a kind of bridle, I put it around the horse's head and tame beast very quiet suffered me to tie him and thus mount him. As soon as I was on his back, I began to kick and beat him and try every means to make him move quickly, but all to very little purpose. He's wilding out. I could not drive him out of the slow pace. While I was creeping along, still within reach of the enemy's shot, I met a servant well mounted on an English horse. I immediately stopped and cried, told him my case and begged of him to help me. And this he affectionately did for having a fine large whip he began to lash my horse so severely that he set off full speed with my, me towards the sea while i was quite unable to hold or manage him in this manner i went along till i came to a craggy precipice i could not stop my horse and my mind was filled with apprehensions of my deplorable fate should he go down the precipice which he apparently sorry he appeared fully disposed to do I therefore thought I had better throw myself him off him at once, which I did immediately with great dexterity or dexterity, and fortunately escaped unhurt. As soon as I found myself at liberty, I made the best of my way to the ship, determined not to be so foolhardy in the future. So he goes out and gets <laughs> and gets caught up in some enemy territory. And that's interesting. Uh, uh, section eight, chapter four. We continued to besiege the citadel till June when it surrendered. During the siege, I have counted about 60 shells and carcasses in the air at once. When this place was taken, I went through the citadel and into the bomb proofs under it, cut in the solid rock, and I thought it a surprise place, both for strength and building. Notwithstanding our shots and shells had made amazing devastation and ruinous heaps all around it. After taking of this island, our ships with some others commanded by Commodore Stanhope in Swiftshore went to Bass Road where we blocked up a French fleet. Our ships were there from June to February following. And at that time I saw a great many scenes of war and stratagems of both sides to destroy each other's fleet. Sometimes we would attack the French with some ships of the line at other times with boats and frequently we made prizes. Once our or twice the French attacked us by throwing shells with bomb vessels one day, as a French vessel was throwing shells at our ships, she broke from her spring behind the Isle of Aideri. The tide being complicated, she came within a gunshot of Nassau, but the Nassau could not bring a gun to bear upon her, and thereby the Frenchmen got off. We were twice attacked by the fire floats, which they chained together and then let them float down with tide, but each time we sent boats with grapplings and told them safe out of the fleet. We had different commanders at this place, Commander Stanhope, Dennis Lord Howell, etc. From thence or hence before the Spanish War began our ship and the Wasp Sloop very sloop were sent to St. Sebastian in Spain. 
by Commodore Stanhope and Commodore Dennis afterwards sent us to Cartel in Bayonne in France, after which we went to February 1762 to Belize, Belle Isle, sorry, and there stayed to the summer when we left it and returned to Portsmouth, Portsmouth, 1762, 1762, very interesting. We have a note here. It says, among others whom we brought from Bayonne were two gentlemen who had been in the West Indies where they sold slaves and they confessed they made at one time a false bill of sale and sold two Portuguese white men among a lot of slaves. Wow. Some people have it that sometimes shortly before persons die, the ward has been seen that is some spirit exactly in their likeness, though they are themselves at other places at the same time. This is a note. One day while we were at Bayonne, Mr. Mondale saw one of our men as he thought in the gun room and a little after coming out of the quarter deck, he spoke of the circumstance of this man to some of the officers. They told him that the men, man was then out of the ship in one of the boats with the lieutenant. But Mr. Mondale would not believe it. And we searched the ship when we found that the man was actually out of her. And when the boat returned some time afterwards, we found the man had been drowned at the very time Mr. Mondale thought he saw him. Very interesting. Back to the story. Our ship having arrived at Portsmouth, or Portsmouth, we went into the harbor and remained there till the end of November when we heard great talk about peace. And to our very great joy in the beginning of December, we had orders to go up to London with our ship to be paid off. We received this news with loud hoosas and every other demonstration of gladness. And nothing but mirth was to be seen through every part of the ship I too was not without my share of general joy of this occasion. I thought not, now of nothing but being free and working for myself and thereby getting money to enable me to get a good education. For I had, for I always had a great desire to be able to at least read and write. And while I was on board sh ship or, or on shipboard, I had endeavored to improve myself in both while in the Etna Particularly, the captain's clerk taught me to write. Hold on one second, please. For those who have just joined us, we are reading Alado Equiano, and now he's thinking he's going to be free. So let's see what happens. All right, baby business. Y'all already know baby business. Um, where is he at? So the ship captain taught me to write and gave me a smattering of arithmetic as far as the rule of three. There was also on Daniel Queen, about 40 years of age, a man very well educated who messed with me on board this ship and he likewise dressed and atten attended the captain. Fortunately, this man soon became very much attached to me and took great pains to instruct me in many things. One second. It says, fortunately, this man should become very much attended to me and took great pains to instruct me in many things. He taught me to shave, dress hair a little, and also to read in the Bible, explaining many passages to me which I did not comprehend. I was wonderfully surprised to see the laws and rules of my own country written almost exactly here, a circumstance which I believe tended to impress our manners and customs more deeply on memory. Remember, he's, he's, he, he, earlier he spoke about himself being an Igbo. Um, but, you know, we'll revisit that at another time. He says here, um, he says, I used to tell him of this resemblance, and many a time he sat, he have sat up the whole night together at this employment. In short, he was like a father to me, and some used even to call me after his name. They also styled me the black Christian, quote unquote. Indeed, I almost loved him with the affection of a son. Remember, he was taken from his parents at a very young age. Um, he was not even a, a young teenager at that time. Um, he was a young boy. He was taken, if I'm not mistaken, with his sister. Many things I have denied myself that he might have them, 
And when I used to play at marbles or any other game and won a few half pence or got some money for shaving any one, I used to buy him a little sugar or tobacco as far as my stock of money would go. He used to say that he and I never should part. And when our ship was paid off as I was as free as himself or any other man on board, he would instruct me in his business for which I might gain a good livelihood. This gave me new life and spirit. So, okay, he's free now. All right, let's see what happens. This gave me new life and spirits and my heart burned within me while I thought the time long till I obtained my freedom. From, from though, for though my master had not promised it to me, yet besides the assurances, I had often received that he had no right to detain me. He always treated me with the greatest kindness and reposed in me an abund, uh, unbounded confidence. He even paid attention to my morals and would never suffer me to deceive him or tell lies, of which he used to tell me the consequence and that if I did so. He says, G.O.D. would not love me, so that from all this tenderness, I had never once supposed in all my dreams of freedom that he would think of detaining me any longer than I wished. Okay, wait, he's not free yet. Hold up, let's keep going. Chapter, I mean, section nine. In pursuance of our orders, we sailed from Portsmouth for the Thames and arrived at De Deptford in the 10th of December, where we cast anchor just as it was high water. The ship was up about half an hour when my master ordered the barrage to be man manned. And all in an instant, without having before given me the least reason to suspect anything of the matter, he forced me into the barrage, saying I was going to leave him, but he would take care that I did not. I was so struck with unexpectedness of this proceeding that for some time I did not make a reply. Only I made an offer to go for my books and chest for clothes, but he swore I should not move out of his sight. And if I did, he would cut my throat. See, all the, all the niceness, all the treating me well. At the same time, taking out his hanger, I began, however, to collect myself and plucking up courage. I told him I was free and he could not by law serve me so. But this only enraged him the more, and he continued to swear and said he would soon let me know whether he would or not. And that instant sprung himself into the barrage from the ship to the astonishment and sorrow of all on board. The tide, rather unluckily for me, had just turned back downward so that we quickly fell down the river along with it till we came along some outward bound West Indian men. For he was resolved to put me on board the first vessel he could to get to receive me. The boat's crew who pulled against their will became quite faint at different times and would have gone ashore, but he would not let them. Some of them strove then to cheer me and told me he could not sell me and that they would stand by me and revive me a little. And I still entertain hopes for as, as they pulled me along, he asked some vessel to receive me and they refused. But just as we had got a little below Gravesend, we came alongside of a ship going away the next tide for the West Indies. Her name was Charming Sally. Yeah, I hear my voice right. Captain James Doran, my master went on board and agreed with him for me. And in a little time, I was sent for into the cabin. When I came there, Captain Doran asked me if I knew him. I answered, I did not. Then said he, you are now my slave. Chill. <laughs> I told him my master could not sell me to him, nor to anyone else. Why did, why said he, did not your master buy you? I confessed he did, but I've served him, said I, many years, and he has taken all my wages and prize money, for I only got one sixpence during the war. Besides this, I have been baptized, and by the laws of the land, no man has a right to sell me. And I added that I had heard a lawyer and others at different times told my master so. They both then said that those people who told me so were not my friends. But I replied, it was very extraordinary that other people did not know the law as well as they did. As well as they. Upon this, Captain Doran said, I talk too much English. And if I did not behave myself well and be quiet, he had a method on board to make me. I was too well convinced of his power over me to doubt that he, what he said. And my former sufferings in the slave ship presented themselves to my mind. The recollection of them made me shudder. However, before I retired, I told them that as I could get, could not get any right among men here, I hope 
I should hereafter in heaven. And I immediately left the cabin and filled with resentment and sorrow. The only coat I had with me was my master, with me my master took away with him and said, if your prize money had been 10,000 pounds, I had a right to it all and would have taken it. So he's like, oh, the dude was all nice. He was all this, that, and that, that, and that. And dude, when it was time for him to gain his freedom, he, he backstabber. I had about nine guineas, which during my long seafaring life, I had scraped together from trifling prerequisites and little ventures. And I hid it that instant, lest my master should take that from me likewise. Still hoping that by some means or other, I should make my escape to the shore. Indeed, by some means or other, I should have made my slave to the score. Indeed, some of my old shipmates told me not to despair, for they would get me back again, and that as soon as they could get their pay, they would immediately come to Portsmouth to me, where the ship was going. But alas, all my hopes was baffled, and the hour of my deliverance was as yet far off. My master, having soon concluding his bargain with the captain, came out of the cabin, and he and his people got into the boat and pulled off. I followed them with aching eyes as long as I could. And when they were out of sight, I threw myself on the deck with a heart ready to burst with sorrow and anguish. That was a wild turn right there um, in the end of chapter four, because earlier on as a child, he resolved to, uh, to mock or mimic that of his oppressor. Um, he, he chose assimilation in hopes that his servitude would be enough to garner his freedom. But, you know, this is why, you know, at this point, as we're reading, he's shocked because he began to actually believe that the oppressor was actually his friend or could befriend him. Son of Levy said, Shalom fam, thank you for your time and for your love project. If I wasn't usually on the go, I would help you with the reading, even if I'm not as good a reader as you. Thank you, son of Levy. Um, Evans said hello all just here for a minute, but I wanted to say hello. What's up Evans? How you doing? But your con contribution is greatly appreciated. I learned a lot and thank you sons, son of Levy. I know a lot of people are on the move. You know, it, it, it's been a few, uh, <clears throat> it's been a few weeks. I, I didn't stop the left project. I was just doing it in other capacities and I'm like, you know, I got to get back over here to YouTube and, uh, try to get it in. I know I ha I keep unusual hours, you know, being a full-time mommy at home business. So it's all understood. You know, the endurance, everybody who tunes in, who gives their word of encouragement is really appreciated because, uh, you know, it's this is this right here is a labor of, of love. And it's also something, like I said, it, 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 it didn't go on deaf ears. I actually, at the end of this, I'm going to also take some time off to do some writing, uh, expressing a lot of what I've learned during this time, this last year. So chapter five, let's see if we could get through this chapter five. So thank everybody for tuning in. The author's reflection on his situation is deceit by a promise of being delivered his despair at sailing for the West Indies. So he's going back to the West Indies. He was there already, and now they're trying to take him back again. Arrives at Montserrat, where he is sold to Mr. King. Various interesting instances of oppression, cruelty, and extortion, which the author saw practice upon the slaves in West Indies during his captivities from the year 1763 to 1766, address on it to the planters. So for three years now, Montserrat. Montserrat is a little small island. Let me see. I know it's a little small island in the West Indies, but I think it's I think it's French speaking, if I'm not mistaken. Hold on. You know me already. Kind of like to get before I know he landed in Barbados. It's a Caribbean island. No, it's British territory. It's British territory. Let me see what Montserrat. Give me a second. Let me see what it's closest to. No, it was one of the isles. All right, it's south of Puerto Rico. 
in south of Puerto Rico, Dominica, Martinique, St. Lucia, that whole downturn right there. All right, cool. So he, and, and it's a really small island. It's, um, it's not one of the bigger islands. It is one of the Leeward Islands, specifically in the Leeward Islands. Population is no more than 5,000 people. So that's a really small island there. That's 5,000 people is like <laughs> in one little space within, uh, you know, Brooklyn, you know, uh, one little neighborhood in Brooklyn is like 5,000 people. So very interesting. All right, let me continue here. So he ends up in Montserrat. Let's see what's good. It's chapter five. Thus, at the moment I expected all my toils to end, was I plunged, as I supposed, in a new slavery, in comparison of which all my service here to, hitherto had been perfect freedom. And this is what we say. He, he didn't know hard labor, and whose horrors always present to my mind, now rushed on it with tenfold aggravation. I wept very bitterly for some time and began to think that I must have done something to displease the Lord, that he thus punished me so severely. This filled me with painful reflections of my past conduct. I recollected that, sorry, I recollected that on the morning, give me one sec. All right, he says here, I recollected that on the morning of our arrival at Deptford, I had very harshly sworn that as soon as we reached London, I would spend the day in rambling and sport. My conscience smote me for this unguarded expression. I felt that the Lord was able to disappoint me in all things and immediately considered my present situation as a judgment of heaven on account of my presumption in swearing. I therefore with con contrition of heart Acknowledged my transgression to G.O.D. and poured out my soul before him with unfeigned repentance and with earnest supplication. I besought him not to abandon me in my distress, nor cast me from his mercy forever. In a little time, my grief spent with its own violence began to subside. And after the first confusion of my thoughts was over, I reflected with more calmness of my present condition. I can, because remember, this is a re injury. He, he already experienced being stolen away. And so, you know, he, again, as we have this conversation over and over about there being no necessarily uh, right way to quote unquote be a slave, he, 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 he's like, okay, you know, he's gonna get himself together. So let's see what he says. I consider that trials and disappointments are sometimes for our good. And I thought G.O.D. might perhaps have permitted this in order to teach me wisdom and resignation. For he had hitherto shadowed me with the wings of his mercy and by his invisible but powerful hand had brought me the way I knew not. These reflections gave me a little comfort and I arose at last from the deck with dejection and sorrow in my countenance, yet mixed with some faint hope that the L.O.R. dear Lord would appear for my deliverance. And remember, he sounds like, um, Lewis Hughes, um, you know, there's some people who depends on how they take their current situation. And Lewis, uh, I believe it was Lewis Hughes who had that resolve that, you know, I'm going to continue to push through and, and one day I, I will see my freedom again. It says, soon afterwards, as my new... Soon afterwards, as my new master was going on shore, he called me to him and told me to behave myself well and do the business of the ship, the same as any of the rest of the boys, and I should fear the better for it. But I had made him no answer. I was then asked if I could swim, and I said no. However, I was made to go under the deck and was carefully watched. The next tide, the ship got underway and soon arrived at the mother bank, part Portsmouth, where she waited for days, for, waited for a few days for some of the West India convoy. While here, I tried every means I could devise amongst the people of the ship to get me a boat from the shore. 
as there was none suffered to come along side of the ship and their own whenever it was used was hoisted in again immediately a sailor on board took a guinea from from me of pretense of getting me a boat and promised me time after time that it was hourly to come off when he had the watch upon deck i watched also and looked long enough but all in vain i could never see either the boat or my guinea again and that i thought was still the worst of all the few gave information as i afterwards found all the while to my mates for my intention to go off if possible but rogue like he never told them he had got a guinea from me to procure my escape however after we had sailed in this stick sorry and his trick was made known to the ship's crew i had some satisfaction in seeing him detested and despised by them all for his behavior to me i was still in hopes that my old shipmates would not forget their promise to come for me in portsmouth and indeed at last but not till the day before we sailed some of the some of them did come there and sent me off some oranges and other tokens in their regard they also sent me word they would come off to me themselves the next day or the day after and a lady who also lived in ghostport wrote to me and she would come and take me off the ship at the same time this lady had been very intimate with my former master i used to sell and take care of a great deal of property for her in different ships in return she always showed great friendship for me i used to tell me i used to tell my master she would take me away to live with her but unfortunately for me a disagreement soon afterwards took place between them and she was succeeded in my master's goods graces by another lady who appeared so mistress of the etna and mostly lodged on board i was not so great a favor with this lady as with the former she had conceived a, a pick against me a peculiar against me on some occasion when she was on board and she did not fail to instigate my master to treat me in the manner he did and he puts here that the master says thus was i sacrificed to the envy and resentment of this woman for knowing that the other lady designed to take me into her service, which had I got on shore, she would have been able to prevent. She felt her pride alarmed at the superiority of her rival in being attended by a black servant. It was not less to prevent this than to be revenged of me, on me, she that she caused the captain to treat me thus cruelly. Go back to number one, please. This is portion number three on chapter number five. However, the next morning, for those who just joined us, we're reading Olado Equiano, chapter five, portion three. The link is in the box. You can definitely follow along. If you're willing to read this time or any upcoming time, feel free to let me know and I will send you the link. However, the next morning, the 30th of December, the wind being brisk and easterly, the Elios frigate, which was to escort the convo made a a signal for sailing. All the ships then got up their anchors, and before any of my friends had an opportunity to come off to my relief, to my inexpressible anguish, our ship had got underway. What tumultuous emotions agitated my soul when the convoy got under sail, and I, a prisoner on board, now without hope. I kept my swimming eyes upon the land in a state of unutterable grief, not knowing what to do, and despairing how to help myself. While my mind was in this situation, the fleet sailed on, and in one day's time, I lost sight of the wished for land. In the first expression of my grief, I reproached my fate and wish I had never been born. I was ready to curse the tide that bore us, the gale that wafted my prison, and even the ship that conducted us. And in the despair of the moment, I called on, well, he called on death to relieve him from the horrors that he felt and dreaded I might be in that place. And then he's and it says where slaves are free and men oppressed no more fool that i was inured so long to pain to trust to hope or dream of joy again now dragged once more beyond the western main to groan beneath some dastard planter's chain where my poor countrymen in bondage wait the long enf enfranchisement of lingering fate hard hard lingering fate while ere the dawn of day Roused by lash, they go their cheerless way, and as their souls with shame and anguish burn, salute with groans on welcome morn's return. And chilling 
or chiding every hour's the slow packed sun, pursue their toils till all his races run. No eye to mark their sufferings with a tear, no friend to comfort, no hope to cheer. Then, like the dull uppity brute, to stalls as wretched and as coarse as fear. Thank heaven one day the misery was over. They sink to sleep and wish to wait no more. And the name of that poem is The Dying Negro, a poem originally published in 1773. Perhaps it may not be deemed impertinent here to add that his elegant and pathetic little poem was occasioned by the following incident as appears from the advertisement prefixed to it. A black who a few days before had run away from his master and gotten himself christened with intent to marry a white woman his fellow servant being taken and sent on board a ship in the Thames took an opportunity of shooting himself. And he shot himself in the head. And that's the poem that accompanied that 1773. Name of the poem is The Dying Negro. I don't know if I've never heard that poem before. So again, when we go into this history, there's many things for us to learn and understand. The turbulence back from the poem. I didn't even get to perform it, perform it, come like my throat is like all, oh, you know. The turbulence of my emotions, however, naturally gave way to calmer thoughts, and I soon perceived what fate had decreed no mortal on earth could prevent. The convoy sailed on without any accident, with a pleasant gale and smooth sea for six weeks till February, when one morning the Elinos ran down a brig on one of the convoy, and she instantly went down and was engulfed in the dark recess of the ocean. The convoy was immediately thrown into great confusion till it was daylight, and the Elinos, Elios, Elios, I believe, illuminated with lights to prevent further mischief. On the 13th of February, 1763, from the masthead was descri described our destined island, Montserrat, and soon after I beheld those. Rains of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can rarely dwell, Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges. At the sight of this land of bondage, a fresh horror ran through all my frame and chilled me to the heart. My former slavery now rose in dreadful review in my mind and displayed nothing but misery, stripes, and chains. In the first paroxysm of my grief, I called upon G.O.D.'s thunder and his avenging power to direct the stroke of death to him rather than permit me to become a slave and to be sold from lord to lord. In this state of my mind, our ship came to an anchor and soon after discharged her cargo, her cargo, I now knew what it was to work hard. I was made to help to unload the ship and to comfort me in my distress. At that time, two of the soldiers robbed me of all my money and ran away from the ship. I had been so long used to European climate that at first I felt scorching West India sun very painful while the dashing surf would toss the boat and the people in it, frequently above high water mark. Sometimes our limbs were broken with this or even attended with instant death. I was day by day mangled and torn. Portion number four, chapter number five. About the middle of May, when the ship was got ready to sail for England, I all the time believing that fate's blackest clouds were gathering over my head and expecting that their births would mix me with death, with, with the dead. Captain Doran sent for me on shore one morning and I was told by the messenger that my fate was determined. With trembling steps and fluttering heart, I came to the captain and found him one Mr. Robert King, a Quaker and the first merchant in the place. The captain then told me my former master had sent me there to be sold, but that he had desired him to get me the best master he could. As he told him, I was a very deserving boy, which Captain Doran said he found to be true. And if he were to stay in the West Indies, he would be glad to keep me himself. But he could not venture to take me to London, for he was very sure that when I came there, I would leave him. I at that instant burst out of crying and begging much of him to take me with him to England, but all to no purpose. He told me he had got me the very best master in the whole island with whom I should be as happy as I, as if I were in England. And for the re that reason, he chose to leave him, have me, though he would sell me to his own brother-in-law for a great deal more money than that he got from that gentleman. My new master, Mr. King, then made a reply and said the reason he had bought me was on account of my good character. 
and as he had not the least doubt of my good behavior, I should be very well off with him. He also told me he did not live in the West Indies, but at Philadelphia, where he was going, soon going. And as I understood something of rules of arithmetic, when we got there, he would put me to school and fit me for a clerk. The conversation relieved my mind a little, and I left those gentlemen considerably more at ease in myself than when I came to them. And I was very thankful to Captain Dorian and even to my old master for the character they had given me, a character which I afterwards found of infinite service to me. He reminds me of Yosef, Joseph in Egypt, where even though he's in these situations, he doesn't stay in um, you know, hard servitude for very long. He moves from space to space um, that allows him a level of uh, reprieve. He says, I went on board again and took leave of all my shipmates and all the next day the ship sailed. And when she weighed anchor, I went to the water side and looked at her with a very wishful and aching heart, following her with my eyes until she was totally out of sight. I was so bowed down with grief that I could not hold up my head for many months. And if my new master had not been kind to me, I believe I should have died until it, at, under it at last. And indeed, I soon found that he fully deserved the good character which Captain Dorian had given me of him for he possessed the most amiable disposition and temper and was very charitable and humane. If any of his slaves be behaved amiss, he did not beat or use them ill, but parted with them. This made him afraid of this obliging him. And as he treated his slaves better than any other man on the island, so he was better and more faithfully served by them in return. By this kind treatment, I did at last endeavor to compose myself and with fortitude through though moneyless, determined to face whatever fate had decreed for me. Mr. King soon asked me what I could do, and at the same time said he did not mean to treat me as a common slave. I told him I knew something of seamanship and could shave and dress hair pretty well. I could refine wines, which I had learned on shipboard, where I had often done it, and I could write and understand arithmetic tolerably well as far as the rule of three. He then asked me if I knew anything of gauging, or gauging. And on my answer that I did not, he said one of his clerks would teach me to gauge or gauge. Five of five. Mr. King dwelt or dealt in all manner of merchandise and kept from one to six clerks. He loaded many vessels in a year, particularly in Philadelphia where he was born and was connected with the great mercantile house in that city. He had besides many vessels and dodges of different sizes which used to go about the island and others to collect rum, sugar, and other goods. I understood pulling and managing those boats very well, and, his, and this hard work, which was the first that he sent me to in the sugar season, used to be my constant employment. I have rowed the boat and slaved at the oars for one hour to 16 in the 24 hour, during which I had 15 pence sterling per day to live on, though sometimes only 10 pence. However, this was much more than was allowed to other slaves that used to work often with me and belong to other gentlemen of the island. These poor souls had never more than nine pence a day and seldom more than six pence from their master or owners. Though they earned three or four pistarines, and pister, pistarines are the value of a shilling. For it is a common practice in the West Indies for men to purchase slaves, though they have not plantations themselves in order to let them out to planters and merchants at so much a piece by the day. And they give what they choose out of this produce of their daily work to their slaves for subsistence. This allowance is often very scanty. <clears throat> it says, my master often gave the owners of these slaves two and a half of these pieces per day and found the poor fellows in victuals himself because he thought his owners did not feed them well enough according to the work they did. The slaves used to like this very well, and as they knew my master to be a man of feeling, they were always glad to work for him in preference to any other gentleman, some of whom, after they had been paid for the poor people's labor, would not give them their allowance out of it. Many times have I seen these unfortunate wretches beating for asking for their pay, and often severely flogged by their owners if they did not bring them their daily or weekly money exactly to the time. Though the poor creatures were obliged to wait on the gentlemen they had worked for, sometimes more than half the day before they could get their pay, and this generally on Sundays when they wanted the time for themselves. In particular, 
I know a countryman of mine who once did not bring the weekly money directly that it was earned. And though he brought it the same day to his master, yet he was staked to the ground for his pretended, pretended negligence and was just offered to receive a hundred lashes, but for a gentleman who beg, begged him off 50. The poor man was very industrious and by his frugality had saved so much money by working on shipboard that he had got a white man to buy him a boat, unknown to his master. Sometime after he had his little estate, the governor wanted a boat to bring him sugar from different parts of the island. And knowing this to be a Negro man's boat, he seized upon it for himself and would not pay the owner a farthing. The man of this went to his master and complained to him of the act of the government or the governor. But the only satisfaction he received was to be damned very heartily for his master who asked him how dared any of his Negroes to have a boat. So we see this uh, not being able to have anything. Um, we see this thought process continue. Hey, person kid, what's going on? Right now we're reading, I'm catching up on a lot of Equiano. This is uh, chapter five, section five. So he thought he was gonna be free. He ended up back in, he ended up back in, um, you know, he thought he was gonna be free in England. The master of the ship betrayed him, sold him back into slavery. And now he's back in the Caribbean in Montserrat. It says here, he seized the pawn for himself and would not pay the owner of Farthling. Okay, he said, how dare you have a boat? If the justly merited ruin of the governor's fortune could be a, just a gratification to the poor man, he had thus robbed, he was not without consolation. Extort, extor, sorry, extortion and rapine are poor providers. And sometime after this, the governor died in the king's bench in England, as I was told, in great poverty. The last war favored this poor Negro man, and he found some means to escape from his Christian master. He came to England where I saw him after several times. Such treatment as this often drives these miserable wretches to despair, and they run away from their masters at the hazard of their lives. Many of them in this place, unable to get their pay when they have earned it, and fearing to be flogged as usual if they return home without it, run away where they can for shelter, and a reward is often offered to bring them in dead or alive. My master used to sometimes in these cases to agree with their owners and to settle with them himself, and thereby he saved many of them a flogging. I'm gonna get a little water here and continue reading. Let's see here, let's see here. Shall let me get another, let me get another bottle of water. There you go, let me get bottle of water, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Section six. Once for a few days, I was left out to fit a vessel and I had no victuals allowed me by either party. At last, I told my master of this treatment and he took me away from it. And many of the states on, on the different islands where I used to be sent for rum and sugar, they would not deliver it to me or to any other Negro. He was therefore obliged to send a white man along with me to those places. And then he used to pay him for six to 10 pisterns a day from being thus employed during the time, thank you, baby, I served Mr. King in going about the different estates on the island. I had an opportunity I would wish for to see the dreadful usage of poor men, usage that reconciled me to my situation and made me bless G.O.D. for the hands into which I had fallen. I had the good fortune to please my master in every department in which he employed me, and there was scarcely any part of his business or household affairs in which I was not occasionally engaged. I often supplied the, the place of a clerk in receiving and delivering cargoes to the ships, intending stores, delivering goods, and besides this, I used to shave and dress my master when convenient and take care of his horse. And when it was necessary, which was very often, I worked likewise on board of his different vessels. By these means, I became very useful to my master and saved him, as he used to acknowledge, about a hundred pounds a year. Nor did he scruple to say I was one of the more advantaged, I was of more advantage to him than any of his clerks, though their usual wages in the West Indies are more, are from 60 to a hundred pounds current a year. I have sometimes heard it asserted that a Negro cannot earn his master the first course, but nothing can be further from the truth. 
I suppose nine tenths of the mechanics throughout the West Indies are Negro slaves. And I well know the, co the coppers among them earn $2 a day. The carpenters the same and oftentimes more, also the masons, smith and fishermen, etc. And I've known many slaves who master would not take a thousand pounds current from them. But surely this assertion refutes itself. For if it be true, why do the planters and merchants pay such a price for slaves? And above all, why do those who make this assertion exclaim the most loudly against the abolition of the slave trade? So much are men blinded and to such inconsistent arguments are they driven by mistake, mistaken interests. I grant indeed that slaves are sometimes by half free, feeding, half clothing, overwork and stripes reduced so low that they are turned out as out unfit for service and left to perish in the woods or to expire on a dunghill. My pass mommy's pen for me, please. Thank you. My master was sever several times offered by different gentlemen 100 guineas for me, but he always told them he, he would not sell me to my great joy. And I used to double my diligence and care for fear of getting into the hands of these men who did not allow a valuable slave the common support of life. Many of them used to find fault with my master for feeding his slaves so well as he did, although I often went hungry. And as an Englishman might think my fare were very indifferent, but he used to tell me, he used to tell them he always would do it because the slaves thereby looked better and did more work. While I was thus employed by my master, I was often a witness to cruelties of every kind, which were exercised on my unhappy fellow slaves. Thank you. Thank you. He says here, oh, I used frequently to have different cargoes of new Negroes in my care for sale, and it was almost a constant price with our clerks and other whites to commit violent depredations on the chastity of the female slaves. So there he goes, admitting to the raping of female slaves coming in, enslaved individuals. <laughs> to these atrocity, I was, though with reluctance, obliged to submit at all times, being unable to help them. When we had some of these slaves on board my master's vessel to carry them to other islands or to America, I have known our mates commit these acts most shamefully to disgrace not of Christians only, but of men. I have even known them gratify their brutal passions. Hold on one second for me. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it says, I have known our mates commit these acts most shamefully to the disgrace, not only of Christians, but of, not of Christians only, but of men. I've even known them to gratify their brutal, brutal passion with females not 10 years old. And these abominations, some of them practiced to such a scandalous success that one of our captains discharged the mate and others on the account. And yet in Montserrat, I have seen a Negro man staked to the ground and cut more shockingly, and then his ears cut off bit by bit because he had been connected with a white woman who was a common prostitute, exclamation point. As if it were no crime in the whites to rob an innocent African girl of her virtue, but most heinous in, in a black man only to gratify a passion of nature where the temptation was offered by one of a different color though the most abandoned woman of their species. So he's saying the prostitute of their culture had more rights than a little girl. Uh, that, you know, as I'm studying and getting ready to, uh, it's two books I want to write really, the 
you know, The Angry Black Woman, the, the volume two, and, an, and, and another book as it relates to our findings in slavery. So this is, when, you, when you're reading, you know, you come across, if you have the, 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 the patience, you know, and the resolve to move through uh, these great bodies of work, you, you will begin to understand a lot as it relates to our present condition. And, um, you know, your understanding will be elevated beyond just the arguing, you know, the emotional response and, and really just getting a handle on what actually really happened and, and how it affected us. And then you'll be, hopefully we'll be able to move forward from there. This is why I think, and, and you know, sometimes when you're doing something, you know, a so few people may understand and then later on more people understand. Um, but why have I been reading this, you know, continually is because for many reasons, as I say and continue to say, and then I'm gonna read uh, seven, section seven, is that first of all, a reading at one point in history was illegal, that's number one. So reading in and of itself, reading with understanding, reading with discernment is a, a bit of a revolutionary act, although some may think you know it, it's commonplace now. There's many of our youths who don't read. Uh, our children need to understand this story. With each generation, we are charged with the responsibility to pass this on. You know, this is when we look at the children and we look out of the landscape and everybody complains of them not knowing it. They're so terrible. Uh, it was actually your job to teach them. And so, you know, it's not something that you can know for yourself and then not pass along. So for many reasons, um, and also for my own growth and, 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 edif and edification in, the, in this space, as I continue to ask the most high over and over, what, why are we so? What, what is our condition? Why have we what has befallen us, you know, and and I said, you know what, we're gonna, uh, I'll share. And so for the last year, you know, I've shared and will continue to share to the end of this year and then, and then just take some time to let it all process and kind of process what it is that I am. Um, and we have uh, gone into uh, during this time. So seven, one, Mr. D told me he had sold 41,000 Negroes and for those people who run around talking about it didn't happen, you know, the Holocaust, you know, the transatlantic slave trade didn't happen. Um, no such thing. We're already here. <clears throat> this is why I, I tend to, and I haven't even really scratched the surface, read very primary, primary sources, because there's a lot of doctrines falling around. There's a lot of, you know, grief stricken individuals who refuse to deal with the reality um, of what happened but be them melanated or European. And so just to collect information like on a treasure hunt from here and there, we get we are more better equipped not to fall uh, prey to some of these doctrines that are coming out, trying to convince us that, you know, it really didn't happen the way they said it happened. It wasn't really that bad. All of this is to distance us from the reality of it happening and actually doing something about the effects of it and fixing our condition. So again, seven, it says one Mr. D told me that he had sold 41,000 Negroes and he once cut off a Negro man's leg for running away. I asked him if the man had died in the operation, how he as a Christian could answer for the horrid act before GOD. And he told me answering was a thing of another world and that he thought he did and that he thought and did with policy were policy. I told him that the Christian doctrine taught to do unto others as you would have them to do unto us. He then said his scheme had the desired effect. It cured that man and some others of runaway. And there was a man named Samuel Cartwright, I believe his name is, who came up with Draptomania. And I want to see the year of this because he was walking around telling people um, that yes, uh, your slaves are something is wrong with them if they want to. He, he was 1851, so he was sometime later. Um, telling them he was a Samuel Cartwright, right? He walked around telling people, Oh, your slaves are uh, there's something wrong with them, there's some kind of medical condition if they don't want to be in servitude, they have some illness, and these are the things he suggested to do. So, what like, like this man is saying here, this was a matter of policy, policy in, in maiming, where in when they say Christian and you're reading the Bible and people say, 
The Bible sanctioned this. The Bible didn't sanction uh, what they did to the degree that they did it because biblically, if you maim or if you uh, injure your servant in any way, you're supposed to let them go for that. If it's their eye, you let them go for their eye's sake. If it's their tooth, you let them go for the tooth's sake. The, you know, the, the brutality, the inhumane brutality that took place, that um, is not substantiated in what they are saying um, that they should be. There, there are definitely spaces that speaks of something else that's divine as, as uh, Oladu Equiano uh, spoke of, a divine retribution, asking the creator, is this something else? But to what the European took in their hands to perpetuate that was totally another level. It was totally another level, but I'll continue here. The man says, another Negro man was half hanged and then burnt for attempting to poison a cruel overseer. Thus, by repeated cruelties, are the wretched first you urged to despair and then murdered because they still re retain so much of human nature about them as to wish to put an end to their misery and to retaliate on their tyrants. The, these overseers are indeed, for the most part, persons of the worst character of any denomination of men in the West Indies. And we know, you know, in America, and I'm glad we're taking a look into West Indian, you know, what was going on in the West Indies. And the same in America, it was over the lower classes of people who couldn't necessarily own slaves. So the next thing for them was to be able to rule over them. And many of them were very cruel, <clears throat> uh, tyrannical, as he said individuals. It says, unfortunately, many humane gentlemen by not residing on their estates are obliged to leave the management of them in the hands of these human butchers who cut and mangle the slaves in a shocking manner on the most trivial occasions and altogether treat them in every respect like brutes. They pay no regard to the situation of pregnant women, nor the least attention to the lodging of the field Negroes. Their huts, which ought to be well covered and placed dry where they take their short repose, are often open sheds built in damp places, so that when poor creatures return tired from the toils of the field, they contract many disorders from being exposed to the damp air in the uncomfortable state, while they are heated and their pores are open. Again, the Caribbean had a lot of absentee plantation owners. They are in England or they are in America or wherever they are, and they're not physically there. So they leave it to the landlords, the overseers, um, and they had more rule um, than you would see on, a, you know, on an American plantation. So, you know, it's not even their quote unquote property, you know what I'm saying? So you could, you could just imagine the neglect certainly conspires with many others to cause a decrease in the births as well as in the lives of the grown Negroes. I can quote many instances of gentlemen who reside on their own estates in the West Indies, and then the scene in, is quite changed. The Negroes are treated with lenity and proper care by which their lives are prolonged and their masters profited. To honor the humanity, I know several gentlemen who manage their estates in this manner and found that benevolent was their true interest. And among many I could mention in Montserrat, whose slaves look remarkably well and never needed any fresh supplies of Negroes. And there are many other estates, especially in Barbados, which from such judicious treatment need no fresh stock of Negroes at any time. I have the honor of knowing a most worthy and humane gentleman who is a native of Barbados and who has estates there. This gentleman has written a treatise on the uses of his own slaves. He allows them two hours for refreshment at midday and many other indulgences and comforts, particularly in their lying. And besides this, he rises or raises more provisions on his estate than they can destroy. So that by this attention, he saves the lives of his Negroes and keeps them healthy. And as happy as the condition of slavery can admit, I myself, as, as shall appear in the sequel, manage an estate where by such attentions, the Negroes were uncommonly cheerful and half healthy and did more work by half than by the common mode of treatment they usually do. For want thereof, of such care and attention to the poor, Negroes and otherwise oppressed as they are, it is no wonder that the decree should require 20,000 new Negroes annually to fill up the vacant places of the dead. 
even in Barbados, notwithstanding those humane exceptions, which I have mentioned and otherwise which I am acquainted, that justly make it quote, quoted as place where slaves meet with the best treatment and need, and need fewest recruits of any of the West Indies. That's why they used to call Barbados Little England. Um, Barbados has a, uh, they would call it Little England and the people of Barbados amongst the Caribbean are known to have a certain disposition, uh, 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 not all, but a good amount have this air about them, this cocky disposition. And I find this interesting that he's giving us a look into, you know, it's like saying you work for the good master. We saw this in another book um, where certain slaves would mock and ridicule other slaves who didn't work for a quote unquote good master, whose master may have. So by extension, you, 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 your self-esteem, if you know, was uh, determined by what what master you were associated, and we see that kind of today. And I said this before: by if you work for a prestigious company, you feel more um, worthy because of your connection to someone else's wealth and affluence. So somebody who works, you know, at the Four Seasons, you know, may say it differently than the person who works at the Red Roof Inn. You understand and this is kind of the same thing because you're working for these people um even if they're not paying you so again people landing big jobs with big corporations we, we it's not so far-fetched that you will have a different air about you and based on what he's saying here uh barbados didn't need didn't have as much harsh treatment according to what he's seeing as the other islands it says even in barbados notwithstanding those humane humane exceptions which I've mentioned and others which I am acquainted that justly make it quoted as a place where slaves meet with the best treatment and new fewest recruits of any in the West Indies. Yet this island required 1,000 Negroes annually to keep up the original stock, which is only 80,000. So that the whole term of a Negro's life may be said to be there but 16 years. Wow. And yet the climate here is, is every respect the same as that from which they are taken, except in being more wholesome. Do the British colonies decrease in this manner? And yet what a prodigious difference is there between an English and West Indian climate? And he's asking the question. Let me see here. I'm going to stop here. We are at, this book took a turn like, I'm, and I kept saying to my children, I kept saying to my daughter, we got to get Alado off the boat. So we finally did get him off the boat. But lo and behold, what did we find when he got off the boat? He actually landed back into slavery, another form of slavery. But still, he's not at the bottom of the rung. He's still in a space where he can see himself like he's like, uh, like speaking about his uh fellow enslaved individuals. He calls them poor wretches and that he's more fortunate. And so at this point, I'm going to stop. We are on chapter five, section eight. Hopefully I'll be able to come back not so long as before and read up the rest of, we have like two more sections, two, two more sections to the end of chapter five, and then we'll be on to chapter six. Again, he's, he's, I, you know, I, when you hear me stopping him, I got to get my pen so I can mark some of these very uh, important parts that I find in, in this reading. And so uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, we should be coming back as well on Sunday. If you have and you're wondering, what have I been doing? I've been having a, a community conversation with Sister Mayana last week. We had Sister Shelly on as well. We're going over as it relates to the relationships and the extension of the relations. All of this is affected coming from slavery and before, but definitely the trauma took place during this slavery period. And we're looking over um, one, one woman in the community who has asserted that she has the answers for the relationship woes. And we're going into them, you know, again, I can't leave out the background of, you know, coming from the lens of the trauma. And so I, this is why I think it's important and I have it not to pick on her, but to take a look at the viability um, of what it is that she's peddling and pushing to the community. Uh, and one of the issues that I found and I said, and I'll continue to say, is that she's bringing forth this information outside of the reality of what we actually experience. 
and and in doing so she's you know polling a demographic of people who didn't have our same shortcomings our experience and trauma and by extension it will cause a problem when people try to apply this it's kind of like putting on a brace that wasn't meant for you you know what i'm saying or taking someone else's medication uh you have to really you know get into the issue like we've been doing here at the left project and then from there um get the right solutions to our issues and our problems our shortcomings so with that look out for that it should be coming on sunday and hopefully i'll be able to come back and read up some more of a lot of equiano this this has taken an interesting turn so i look forward to see what else happens i thank everybody for tuning in everybody have a blessed day continue to go forth and be the change that you want to see in the world one